name is Jubarn. Jubarn. Uh, yeah. uh, from Saudi Arabia. My question could be basic and simple, but uh, I am new to this culture, to this spirituality experience, and uh, I would like to understand the consciousness, consciousness more. Is it just a duality between soul and uh, the ego? Is, it, is that all consciousnesses? Are there any other parts? Could you please define them so that I can understand them better? So, when we speak about consciousness, we're actually speaking about this system's ability to perceive what is happening. So it perceives it through the sense of taste, through the sense of smell, through the sense of sight, through the sense of hearing, through the sense of touch, and through another sense which is governed mainly or where the reception happens through the hair and the nails, everything that extends out of the body. So you have these six different senses. Consciousness is the ability to perceive. And the thinking then kicks in and interprets what is being perceived. Correlating to these various senses are areas in the system, like chakras. So you have the very material physical, which correlates with the sense of taste. Then you have the emotional being, which correlates with the sense of smell. Beyond that, you have the conceptual part of your consciousness, where your thinking happens, and that correlates with the sense of sight. Beyond that, you have the transformative part of the consciousness, which, which is actually the creative part of your being, your ability to create. And that correlates with your sense of hearing. So each sense correlates with one of these layers of consciousness. And it goes beyond, it goes into the unity consciousness, which is your ability to, let's say, to, to unify in consciousness with the other, to be one, you know, complete oneness between two people, or between yourself and the environment. Sometimes you look at the tree and you and the tree are one, that experience. So these are various layers of consciousness, actually, that are in action every day, all the time. For a person whose consciousness is expanded, they will not just be functioning in the thinking. They'll become transformative, creative, they'll become... They'll be in unity consciousness, they'll be able to be one with the other. They'll go into a pluriform consciousness, which is in this chakra where they where they will be able to just look at the other and have like an X-ray vision to just know what's going on. There will be all kinds of abilities. But generally, human beings function mainly in a compressed consciousness where they're basically thinking, they're in the conceptual and in the emotional. They're not often very conscious of the body either. So that, in a nutshell, is what consciousness is about in the system, within the system. There is also the cosmic consciousness, which is when, a, when the awareness leaves the system and is not able to perceive consciously anymore, and it goes into cosmic states where it is perceiving the cosmos in an increasingly, let's say, diluted state, where there is less and less body experience and more and more just pure awareness. And you can reach a state where even that experience of awareness falls away. We call it the various samadhi states, savikalpa samadhi, nirvikalpa samadhi. One means a samadhi state where there is some attribute, some experience of, of identity and one state where no identity is there, which can only be known when you come back from it because when you're in that state, you don't know it because there's nothing there to know. So these are the cosmic states of consciousness and then there are the corporeal terrestrial states.
So what you're trying to do is to expand your consciousness and the way you do it is to tune into the truth rather than to give in to the ego. Because the ego will lead to suffering, which means there's a compression of the consciousness. And tuning into the truth will lead to a flowering of joy, which means there's an expansion of consciousness. So that would be a, a short description. But uh, I still need to understand the difference between the ego and the truth, which is, I assume, it's the soul here. Yes. Right? So, but where did the ego come from? What is it? How, how do we deal with it? And uh, is tuning in with the truth the only answer? Or could, could you live without the truth? Could you? Could you live and function happily, uh, have a full life without being spiritual? Well, first let me answer the first question, which was where does ego come from? So when a child is born and it exits the belly of its mother, its socialization processes start. Society starts to teach it things. It teaches it to desire, it teaches it to want, it teaches it to have opinions, it teaches it to push ideas through, it teaches it to insist on things, it teaches it to clamor for things, to yearn, to want, to hope. These are all what a child grows up learning. And the more complex that society is in which that child grows up, the more that child will desire. So that desire body is the ego. And as that ego grows, the child loses contact with its actual master, with the divine, the God actually, which is within. We call it in Sanskrit the antar atman, the soul residing within. So the child loses that contact and the ego grows, so the child continuously is bending down to the ego. Now your question, can we live a full life without being spiritual? It depends on what you mean by spirituality. Living a spiritual life would mean living in a state of surrender to your truth, following this truth rather than the ego. So depending on where you grow up, if you grow up in a, sitting on a tree in Borneo and, and, and spending most of your life in a hammock 200 feet above the earth in a tree, you would definitely not have to do that much to find the soul because the ego is very small because there's not much of desire body being encouraged over there. But if, on the other hand, you grew up in New York City, where from childhood you have been trained to desire, you've, you've been manipulated to desire, you've been brainwashed to desire, you've been puppeteered to desire, then you would have to be spiritual, which means really consciously surrender to that truth in order to live a life of even partial joy, because the suffering would be too much. Can we control the ego and make it work for us instead of against us? Can we do that? Is this something that we can do? The way one operates with ego is one turns away from it. It's like saying, can I make yearning work for me? If in the moment when the yearning hits you, if you turn to the truth, the truth will make you act in such a way that not only does the yearning fall away, but that which is yearned for is realized. So if you go with the yearning, you will not realize what is yearned for. Because the moment, or the yearning won't go away, let's say. Because the moment one yearning is fulfilled, the next one takes its place. So essentially, the moment you yearn for something, you turn into the truth. And the more you turn into the truth, towards the truth, the less the yearning is, but the more the fulfillment is there. So it's a very clever way, actually, to, to keep yourself in a state of joy without going nuts and acting strange. You know, you stay grounded, you stay here and now, you stay connected with everything happening around, and you don't start acting strange and, you know, 
talking to the sky or, or floating around and, and not being able to connect with the other person or not realizing where you are or things like that. So to live a fulfilled life, you would have to tune into the source for sure, especially coming from a, a country where there is an advanced society, which is so-called advanced. Yes, I feel also for someone who, like you, perhaps who's grown up with, you know, with the idea of a, of a God outside. It is a very revolutionary sort of idea, actually, that there is a divinity within, which is the soul, and that one can connect with that soul, which means that it makes you, in that sense, spiritual, because when you connect with the soul, you are independent of an external agency to connect you with the divine. Because the soul within is a drop of the divine, of the cosmic, which is individualized within. So that concept is very hard, possibly, and I don't mean for you, but for someone who grows up with the idea of a God outside, strongly so actually, to reverse that and say, it's within me and I can always connect. And if I observe the ego, I can always in every moment move away from that ego and listen to what that source is telling me in a binary way, like yes and no, negative, positive, that way, you know. It actually works if you take the time to train yourself. One can really, one can actually feel it, which is pretty amazing. considering the fact that it has never really been so precisely known that one can feel an impulse which is a binary one in nature. If you have a question, you can just go to the mic. Yeah, this concept of having divinity within me, I think it's been hijacked by the ego. I think the ego just took that place and decided to say, yeah, yeah, I'm God. And Yes, that's it. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Actually, what happened in the history of humankind is that the founder religions came and they took God out of the human being and put this God somewhere else, made him a man in the first place, and put him somewhere else. And then became the agency between the human being and, the, and that God. And what spirituality does is it takes God and puts it back in the human and says, this divinity is the essence of your being. It's the master of your being. We call it in Sanskrit the Antar Atman. And, and I'm pretty sure there's a word in Arabic for it as well. I, mean, I would not be surprised. Ancient Arabic, Maybe, I mean, yeah. you know, before... Before the Islamic Revolution. Yeah, yeah, before, before more than 1,500 years ago, or Aramaic, those languages. So this is what spirituality does. It, tries, it throws that back in and says, tune in there. That's your master. That's the Lord. That's the divine. Because when you tune in, you actually are able to hear that impulse yourself. You don't have an agency between yourself and your impulse. You know, so it's a very freeing and very individualistic way of living to live a spiritual life. Of course, you live in society, so you do follow the rules and regulations of society, but that doesn't mean that you can't tune in. Because when you actually tune in to the truth, the truth will always guide you through the, through the rocks of society. It'll guide you through, you'll never hurt yourself on the rocks of society. You'll always be within, the, within what society can handle, and yet you will be free. It's very, very powerful, very powerful experience to live in the truth. You know.